fantastic day just having a little explore of everything that's been going around in the mines, everything. We'll get onto that later on, but for now, I'd like to introduce you all to Georgina. Hi, Georgina, you all right? Hi, Philly. I'm good. So, um, we're here in uh, Coal Town, is it? Why is it called Coal Town exactly? So, I'm a curator here at Woodhall Museum, and this gallery is called Coal Town because it's about uh, Ashington, the local town that's right next door to Woodhall. It's called Coal Town because Ashington was the largest pit village in the world. Really? The, as in the entire world, like the planet? I don't think so, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So it's it's amazing because Ashington's only a small town and it's got the lo largest coal pit in the world. That's amazing. So I'm just here in um, in the living room um, where the miners would live in, in back in the day. Is that right? Yeah. So we opened the gallery at around uh, 1914, just before the start of the uh, First World War. Right. And at that time, young boys or young men, I suppose, at the time. Um, in this area of the world would often be expected to get a job uh, around about the age of uh, 13, 14 um, or start their apprenticeship on how to um, start working in the mines um, and so they would often start their day uh, in the middle of the night and they would have to be woken up by their mams or their sisters and go down with their older brothers or fathers for the first day. 13 or 14, the start, that, that is unbelievable. I mean, like a lot of our audience members are like just under 13, so some of them, if they were living in 1914, could wake up on their 13th birthday and then realize they're gonna be a minor. That's, that's, that's just unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time they went to training school before yeah. they went uh, down the pits proper, but they would have started that at um, 14. Wow, that's fantastic. So can you explain this funny hat for the uh, children, please? Yeah, so this is a hat that would be typically worn in the 19th century by uh, a man who worked as a sinker. And a sinker was uh, really important and they were very highly uh, trained and qualified and knowledgeable and experienced in being able to dig uh, pit shafts underground. They, had the, they were the first ones underground, it was one of the most dangerous jobs that you could do because they were the ones setting up all of the supports yeah. in order for other men to go down to dig out the coal. Mad. Okay, I'm going to just try it on now. There we go, have a look. Oh, very fetching. <laughs> and um, I've got here a safety lamp, so they used to take these down with them to the mines, didn't they? Yeah, so a little bit later on, uh, something called the safety lamp was invented in order to give uh, illumination in the light mine because it was very, very dark. Yeah. But then later it uh, reached its real purpose, which was to be able to test for some of the poisonous and dangerous gases in the mine, which had previously caused hundreds and hundreds of deaths. Wow. Well, at least I've managed to invent that to provide any 
any more of those deaths. So I'm going to go and have a go under the mines and imagine what it was like to actually be in the mines. Okay, here we go. Get right down. Sometimes you're working under two foot. Oh, it's not like this. Yeah, you'd be crawling wow. literally on your belly at some point. <laughs> on the belly? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Now, under here, this, oh, that's just fallen off. So under here, there's just carpet. But in the mines, just imagine all the gravel, all like steel, all the works, everything. Just being under here, this would be so uncomfortable. Now, it would be give it a very chair. wet. Be very wet as well. And lots of rats down there, so. Oh, there's no yeah, rats down here, is they? There's no rats, is they, down here? I can't promise anything. Oh, no! Right, okay, I'm gonna be brave. Here we go. Oh. Oh. I've only just crawled, I think, about uh, 10, 15 metres under here, and I'm already exhausted. But, like I said before, it's just carpet. I can't imagine going 100 odd metres underground like this. Oh. And there we are. Oof. actually be standing up again. So where are we right now? And um, who's this chap here sticking his bum up for the uh, for the camera? <laughs> well, uh, we're now at the miners' bats, the pit head bats, that were built at Woodham Colliery uh, in the 1920s mm -hmm. as, a, as a welfare facility so that miners could wash themselves um, before going home at the end of their shift and get rid of all the kind of dirty clothes because they yeah. would have been black from head to toe. Really? Oh, I couldn't, couldn't imagine coming home to all that. Like, um, I've just read this funny quote here, actually. I guess why miners kept their backs black. Uh, now, I've just tried to have a guess and I have no idea. Why is that exactly? So, some miners uh, felt um, it was uh, good luck to keep um, the soot ingrained on their backs, so they wouldn't let anybody wash their backs in case um, they became too clean and then something um, mysterious might happen to them or they might get into an accident. It was superstition. Superstition? That is, that is a weird superstition that, isn't it? I can imagine a lot of miners' wives not being very happy with their husbands still coming home with dirty blacks. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Georgina, can you tell us where we are now then? So now in the gallery, we're in a typical miners' home uh, dating from around the 1920s and 1930s. Where women, um, wives, uh, mothers, sisters were a lot of the time expected to run the household while the men worked down the pit. Right. That involved a lot of hard labour in and of itself, not least because of the amount of washing that was required. Oh, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> so, every week uh, you would have had to get out your washing machine. That's a washing machine? It is. It's called a POS tub, and this is called a POS stick. Right. You would have put your water and your laundry in here, along with your soap flakes, and you would have had to bash. Uh, and uh, scrape around the washing in the uh, water to get it clean. And once it was clean, it would have been such fully saturated, you yep. would have had to put it through your tumble dryer, which is also a mangle. Wait, wait, this is a tumble dryer? Yeah, not so efficient, um, but it would help squeeze out the water in order oh, to be okay. able to hang up the washing on the line out in, outside in the back end. Wow, that's amazing. So a washing machine, it's a little dry. That's, so I'm just going to have a go at this, quickly. So, 
how long would it take roughly to like get, get their clothes dry uh, doing this or at least get all the water off their clothes? Several hours. Hours? Depending on how much washing you have to put through the mouth. Oh, I can imagine the weekend job being just constant hours of spinning and spinning. <laughs> it tended to be the same day, the washing day every week, so everybody hung out the washing on the same day. Wow, and I can just see the uh, clothes just above your head there as well. A uh, couple of tops in there. And what's in that for? So another feature of uh, mining housing and from housing all across uh, the northeastern UK during this time was having uh, outdoor plumbing. You did not have a bath room in your house. You had to get washed in a tin bath, which is hang uh, an example of which is hanging up, up there. Oh, lovely. So you had to fill that bath with hot water from the kettle that would boil on the, on the range. Wow. And then if you wanted to use the toilet, you would have to go outside into the net. Oh. You know what, I would really feel bad for anyone having to go outside, in the rain, just to go have a wee or a poo. <laughs> and you didn't have toilet roll like we do now, we would have used newspaper. Newspaper? Newspaper. Oh. The same stuff you used to have your fish and chips in. Really? That sound, that does sound disgusting, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> So what can you tell us about the sort of kitchen goods of the house then, uh, to do with the miners and the wives and the children and all that? So a kitchen is always part of a home and for women who were married or living with miners, they were expected to run the household and uh, keep them, the men both fed and watered, clean and dry <laughs> for as much of a 24 hour period as possible. So starting off in the morning, that women would set up the fires most likely in order to warm the house up. They would prepare all of the food for the men to go down uh, to work with. A lot of it, everything that um, you wanted to take, wanted to eat on your shift down the pit, you had to take with you. Right. So this would have been a typical lunch box. Okay. It's also known as a bait tin, and it would have fitted in probably some sandwiches for you to take down for your 12 hour shift. All oh, right, okay, so a couple of sandwiches and some water in this thing here. What is it here? It's called, it's like a, um, a tin, tin canister. Yeah. Sometimes it came with like a water bottle flask or something like that, but you hang it off your hip. Um, basically these items were made of metal so that the rats couldn't shoot through them and get to it. Oh, right, well, I mean, the rats must have had a lot of uh, friendly experiences with the miners down there, wouldn't they? <laughs> also something to mention is the fact that there were no toilets underground so you might want to think about how much you're drinking. I see, so can I ask where exactly did they go in the toilets? Did they just used to go in the toilets down the mines or did they have to go up a little bit to... Once to... you went down you did not come back up until it was the end of your shift. Unbelievable. <laughs> that's, that's just unbelievable that. <laughs> Taking place um, because not only was it a day of leisure and enjoyment and for local pride, 
but it was also about um, a rallying cry and had a lot of a uh, lot to do with the trade union movement in the 20, 20th century. All oh, right. So, what were they often talk about in their speeches? Just about the trade union? About is it something to do with pay? Is it something to do with the government? Or it would would have been a mixture of all of those things. Right. Um, and would they have any bands play now, or is it just mainly just for political speeches? Well, uh, most of the time they would have had brass bands uh, performing on the day, um, on, on before they got to this picnic area. So along the high street in Bedlington, there would have been band uh, performances and processions, oh, right. followed by processions of the colliery banners and processions of other um, political uh, movements such as the women's labour movement. Yeah. Wow, that's so interesting. I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing just seeing how the park as it was back in the day and how it's still going on, you know, after 150 years. I mean, that's that's just incredible what, you know, these survivors have sort of created, you know, not just for them, but for their families as well. That's right, um, and of course it wasn't all about uh, the politics, it was also um, uh, lots of fun and enjoyment yeah. to be had on the day. Um, people would have brought their picnics down to Atley Park uh, to, sh to relax yeah. um, and to enjoy the rest of the festivities. Oh, that's amazing. Miners will come to after work or just to sort of chill out. This is a social club, am I right? That's right, yeah. And there was hundreds in Ashington in their heyday. <laughs> um, not so much nowadays, but you would have expected to see all of your friends and colleagues yeah. down here as well as sometimes some of the women, but most of the time women were excluded from these spaces. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> so we've got the, uh, the classic Newcastle kit, haven't we? And I believe some familiar faces as well. That's right, um, in our area of the country, um, in the South East Northumberland, there were a lot of very famous football players that came out of uh, mining villages, not least of all uh, Jackie Milburn, uh, some of his items are on display here. Wow, a hero to a lot of Newcastle fans, definitely. Um, so we've got a photo from the South Africa Tour in 1952. Um, and the Newcastle United Football Club from 1951 to 1952. It's amazing how you know they managed to keep the colour and um, just the constant change for the kits as well. And um, you can imagine a lot of Newcastle fans must have come to the pubs down, especially around Ashington area, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, Derby Day must have been a great time, wasn't it? <laughs> After this is So Georgina, can you tell us whereabouts we are now then? Well, we're in about 1984, just before um, a major disruption in uh, the lives of so many people living across the country, but especially those who were involved in the mining industry. Um, from 1984 to 1985, there was something called a, the Miners' Strike, where all the workers um, in colonies up and down the UK uh, so went on strike and stopped working for almost a, a whole uh, 12 months right. in order to bring um, changes that um, and to protest the closure of the pits. Right, so it was Margaret Thatcher who was Prime Minister at the time who decided to close the mines, am I right? 
uh, sort of, it's, it's a, somewhat, yeah. a little bit more um, complicated than that, but right. that's ultimately um, one, of the, one of the issues was uh, the, the policies of Margaret Thatcher at what, the time. Right, so what was sort of the main reasons as to why the mines were being closed then? It was see, they were seen as uneconomical. Right, okay, what do you mean by non-economical exactly? Um, that they were not, because all the mines were nationalised at the time yeah. and owned by the government, they were seen as not being um, productive enough in terms of finances mm. in order to justify them being open. Right, so it was, a really, it was a really bleak time for the miners, wasn't it? Just, um, you know, not a great time for anyone anyway. That's right, it's really hard for the children of mining families. Yeah. Who, if you were out on strike and you didn't get um, a welfare payments, you obviously weren't bringing in a wage into the yeah. home. So children suffered and they weren't able to get um, food that they would usually get, clothing became harder to afford and whole areas became very, very deprived. That's, that's unbelievable that. So did a lot of miners work separate jobs or, or did they get any sort of strike funds or did, was that not in existence? Yeah, so some, I don't know if they would have necessarily been able to take other jobs, but um, if they were part of their uh, local union, they would be able to access a strike fund and there were a number of fundraising efforts across the country and indeed across Europe in order to raise funds in support of the miners and the miners' strike from far away as Russia and Bulgaria and they sent food and money supplies. Yeah. Some families were allowed to go on holiday to these uh, places. Oh right. Break. Mad. So in 1985, um, did the mines reopen or what, what sort of happened after the strikes? The miners returned to work and the pits continued to close. Oh right. So it's so at least some of them went back to work, but others didn't. But uh, still, it's still a shame for a lot of miners, unfortunately, isn't it? So right side is with the final part of our tour across uh, Woodhall Museum. So Georgina, can you tell us where we are right now? So here we are um, in a typical 1980s living room. Uh, we've got uh, a TV set here. We've got you know, uh, the typical sort of fireplace yeah. and the typical sofa. Yeah, so where's the remote for the talent? <laughs> um, sadly, you'll have to get up off your backside to turn it on. There's no such thing as a remote at this I don't think I don't think even my dad would be very happy to do something like that. <laughs> I mean, just um, you know, switching it on, coming back up to turn the volume, and then coming back on to change the channel. I mean, that must have been an absolute pain for some people, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, and you would have only had a very limited number of channels, about three at this time. Only three you channels. Had to tune the telly in. Wow. Uh, in order to get the picture, there was certainly no streaming services. Oh no, so literally they had to be on the ball, let's say 6 o'clock the news would have started, wouldn't it? And then say, I don't know, 7 o'clock there would have been a show on that they wanted to catch, so they wouldn't be able to record it or download it, they would literally have to be sat on the sofa at 7 o'clock on the dock to catch the channel. Yeah, I mean about this time uh, some VC, uh, VCR recorders <laughs> were about uh, making it into the domestic market, but not many people had them. Oh, was it because they were more expensive or was it because... Yeah. Wow, okay, so how much would the television cost um, within those days, would you know? Cause... Well, a lot of times TVs were bought on, um, on credit, um, so with higher purchases. All right, okay, so credit, would that mean um, different sort of prices, is that what you mean, or just... Uh... It means that you didn't buy the telly outright, it's that you made payments to the shop that you bought it from oh, over right. a series of months and years in order to pay off uh, what was owed. Right, okay, that, that makes sense, so kind of a monthly pay, um, like, you know, say you're paying your bills or something. Exactly, you know? like renting your telly. Oh, all right, fair enough. Well, that's the uh, end of the tour, guys. Um, massive, massive thank you, Georgie. You've been absolutely incredible. And to be honest, this is probably my favourite part of our adventures so far.